it is a it is an honor and a privilege to be interviewing Terry Shaw today, who's been a townie for years and years. And Terry, what I what I uh, love about your post is um you you talk so much about just down and dirty day to day composites. I mean dentistry for the the real man. I mean you're um you know a lot of people want to do. Um, you know, they want to talk about veneers or they want to talk about CAD cam or lasers or all this fancy dancy stuff. But, but as a real dentist in Phoenix and you're a real dentist in Canada, for every time you do a veneer case, you're probably going to do what? 500 direct composites? Well, easily. <laughs> easily. And so, uh, so, uh, you're, you're the man. Um, so tell us about yourself. Now you're, you live, uh, north of Maine. You, you live, you're north of Maine. Uh, actually we're due east of Maine. We're about 70, 70 miles from the top of Maine. We're due east. Uh, actually, out over there. So uh, there was no hospital in Perth Andover. It's a very small community, and we have a hospital now, but we didn't then. Very good. And didn't they find some um, Viking explorer ships there like 10 years ago? That's in Lansdowne Meadows in, up in Newfoundland. It's about 1,200 miles east of here, way out Towards Greenland, actually, Newfoundland is quite a ways away from here. But they did. Their lands that we were, my wife and I, have been there. They they found a lot of trinkets and uh, oh, needles and it definitely was Vikings. Definitely. About what? About about 1000 A.D. Yeah, from 1000 A.D. Yeah, my wife actually is Danish, so uh, her parents came from Denmark and back in 48. So she's uh, she's a Viking. So <laughs> so what do they figure? They 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 just turn around and left, or do you think they tried? No, they were there. They were there for quite a few years, and they they seemed left. Some people seem to get down the coast because they talk about Vineland, and there's certainly no Wineland, Vineland, Wineland, and there's no certainly vines grow, or wines growing in Newfoundland. And they, they think they went down the coast, and they're just not sure how far they went. Cape Cod's uh, down the coast of the United States but, and Canada. They went down the east coast. But they died out, or do they? No, I think they probably went home, and uh, they probably went back to uh, Iceland and uh, Greenland and that sort of thing. I, I don't know. We're just speculating here. But. Huh. Well, um, and you graduated from probably the most famous dental school that ever lived in the history of uh, ever since Facebook came out, <laughs> the <laughs> University of Dalhousie, where uh, a couple of uh, young boys were uh, posting girly pictures and inappropriate comments. And uh, did that? I'm not sure how many pictures they posted, but they posted some pretty idiotic, dumb comments, and uh, they're paying the price for it. Really, they probably aren't. Some of them aren't going to graduate this year. They were fourth year dental students and uh, just testosterone got a hold of them, I guess, and uh, you know, sort of like locker room chatter. And it should never have hit the it should never have hit the news, really. I don't think. But anyway. Yeah, I uh, I've raised four boys. Uh, they're currently uh, 19, 21, 23, and 25. So I, <clears throat> I've dealt with a lot of boy issues, and uh, um, I talked to many dental school deans. You know what dental school deans actually tell me? They tell me that girls are starting to reach Menarch at like 10% by age 10, and they go through their crazy period. You know, they're, they're done being crazy in, in, in the middle of high school. And boys go to college, and that's when they, you know, they get up to, what, 1,200 milligrams of testosterone per deciliter, and I think last time at 52, I had mine checked, I'm at like 400. And uh, they, they just do the craziest, dumbest thing. College are their craziest years. And, well, uh, I think they're age matches their IQ at that point. Yeah, no, well put. I, uh, I, uh, my, my boys, it's funny, they'd always ask me what time they'd have to be home, and I'd say, you know, because all their other friends had a curfew, like it was based on, you know, the, the where, where the sun was in position to the earth or moon, and I'd always say, well, I wouldn't know who you're out with, and they'd say, you know, I'm out with Alan Funk, I'd say, okay, well, you need to be home at nine o'clock, and they're like, dad, and then they'd say another boy, and I'd say, if you're with that boy, you can stay with him for three 40 days and 40 nights. I'm not worried about that kid. But so, so Terry, um, tell me this. Um, has CAD CAM machines um, have replaced a lot of uh, MOD composites? Um, I noticed you play so many uh, amazing cases on Dental Town. Um, tell, tell, us, um, tell us your composite technique and what your thoughts are on composites. Well, a lot of the, uh, the crazy stuff... Uh I was amalgam up to about 83, 84 and ran into Ron Jordan in Moncton at a course and uh, he was talking about posterior composites and and that was way back when we put liquid acid etch all over teeth and sort of wink, wink, don't let it touch the dentin. Uh, and uh, I started doing a lot of composites back in uh, 
oh, probably 84, 85, 86 along there, pretty well left the amalgam behind just because it tended to bond, bond the tooth together. And uh, uh, over the years in the, in the 90s, I used to do uh, quite a few Maryland bridges. The, you know, you, and it always broke my heart to have to cut into the lingual of a, an upper tooth and uh, shave away some, some good healthy tooth structure to make room for my metal. And also sometimes, you know, you didn't take quite enough off and you know, a lot of the failures probably were due to maybe inadequate uh, enamel removal. You got thin metal, it flexes and pops off. And probably in 91, 92, 93, I started doing with composite. And uh, lo and behold, they worked. And uh, I had probably have done six, seven hundred of things by now. And I just do them routinely in composite. I don't have to touch a tooth. There's no enamel taken away. And the damn things work. Uh, I got some that are 5, 10, 20 years old, never been touched. I mean, some of them do crack. I just run a big diamond through and rough it up, sandblast it, uh, micro-etch it, and re rebond it. And the solder joints, I think the reason the composite bridges work so well, uh, they're very huge, very large. Uh, remember the old Tetris came out there? Vargas came out and it was breaking. It was supposed to be the new great ceramic, you know, bridge material, and it just didn't have big enough solder joints. And uh, I think that's the reason that composite bridges do so well. And and uh, also at the same time, I started building teeth out of composite. Basically, I take old crappy crowns off and do them in the composite. And uh, a lot of these people didn't have a ton of money. A lot of it was driven economically driven. And lo and behold, again, these these silly crop. That had an old porcelain things. They're five and ten years old, and you know they're, they're working. They're lasting. I, I remember years ago, Ron Jordan, probably about 80, 83, 84, 85. He said in composite, he said basically what you get at eighteen months is what you get, and uh, you know so that's great. Uh, Composite wears it protects itself. That's my my line, and uh, you know you you do these large fillings, and they, occasionally they fail. But I I don't have a big problem with failure, and you know uh, crowns fail. Everything everything in dentistry everything fails eventually. And, you know, but uh, anyway, so I don't do a lot of porcelain. I don't do a lot of veneers. I do them directly. And that is one of my biggest pet peeves among uh, dentists and their. Uh, how they locker room talk. I mean, they always when when four more when two or more dentists get together, they always sound like engineers. When dentistry isn't about civil engineering, mechanical engineering, um, it's really a biology issue. I mean, we it, it's it's the uh, it's the one trillion um, bacteria in our three pounds of gut microbiome, and we see that you know people with gum disease don't have decay rates. Low decay rates, people with high decay rates don't have gum disease. Sometimes they get on medications or, or catch uh, viruses and get yeast infections. And at the end of the day, they're all they're all going to fail from biology. But hey, I want you um, I want you to what there, there's kids in there. You know, we have uh, we have uh, a lot of lot of lot of uh, dental students are big fans of this um this podcast series. Uh, these are downloaded around the world. Um, walk um, walk the listener through your composite technique and, and try to be specific. My, my brand is that with uh, the internet, no dentist should have, ever have to practice solo again. So give them name brand specifics, everything they need to know to know what Terry is actually, what what you're using, okay. what you're doing and why. Okay, well, I use a rubber dam 99% of the time and I have 39 years and I think that's a big part. Uh, as Ed alludes to a lot on Dental Town, uh, it's, it's a big reason for the success of composite dentistry is rubber dam, good isolation. You're always going to have fluid seeping out of the, you know, the crevice around the tooth. And if you don't have it sealed off and isolated, you might as well forget about it. I see a lot of poor composite dentistry in my in my world. Uh, anyway, what I do, I'm using, I believe it's uh, uh, Bisco's Etch. I'm not even sure. A lot of the stuff like that, I don't. It's a gel. And I always put it around the enamel first, and I flood the uh, flood the dentin with it. I try to etch enamel for 20 seconds, and the the dentin probably 10 to 15. Uh, and I rinse it profusely for a few seconds, and, and, I, and I dry it either with my suction or my air, air syringe. I I watch it to like evaporate most of the uh, the liquid. And there's a, just a sheen a sheen to it, a little bit of uh, moisture, and I'm still using. All bond too. Uh, I started in '91. John Kanka was in Moncton with Ron Jordan about '89 or '87, 
stuff like that and talking about uh, dent and bonding and all this stuff and uh, so I've been still using an old 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 technique because the damn stuff works I understand it I mix my primers a, a and B primer together and I use a, a 3m cotton uh, 3m foam pledge it and uh, they're just foam applicators, and uh, the two drops go in a, in a, in a mixing well, and the uh, foam applicator will pick up about two-thirds of that the first time, and I dab that on usually five times onto the dent. I don't try to put a lot on the enamel, although a lot of times it's impossible to avoid the enamel, but it doesn't do anything for the enamel. And I put five coats, and I go back to my well and get another fill up the, the sponge again, and I put on five more coats, and it, it takes... Uh, probably takes a minute for me to do my priming technique or step, but uh, you you remember what it was like before we could you know, etch dent, before we could bond to dentin, and uh, etching enamel has been rock solid forever, and to be able to get you know that extra bonding strength with your dentin, I think it's worth a minute of my time, and uh, to to you know really well you know if I do say two MODs on a person, it takes me a better part of an hour. Uh, what's a minute, 60 seconds to get a good get, get a good primed hybrid surface. And the other benefit, a lot of benefits to a hybrid surface, a good prime surface, well, you, 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 <clears throat> I never use a liner. I don't use any die cal or I don't, don't use any any bases under my composite. And that's what Don, John Kanka taught me 25 years ago. Uh, I just put the resin on and, and light cure it. And a lot of times in the interior and sometimes in some, sometimes I, I Cure the the resin and the composite together. Uh, sort of just depends. Uh, but I, I usually will uh, will cure my resin and then I put my composite in. I'm using a, a micro hybrid. Uh, I haven't gone to the nanofills because they're not as strong. Uh, basically, from what I've read, they're not as strong. They're 30 percent uh, weaker than the uh, the micro hybrids. That's a Z250. I I tend to use most of the time. Uh, it's also cheaper because it's not in vogue like the the, the you know your ultra your your Filtrack Supreme Ultra, they're, they're considerably more expensive. And they polish better, but they don't, the, 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 the nanofillers polish better. Uh, that, that's the biggest advantage, but in the posterior, I don't think that's a, you know, in the anterior maybe so, more so, but the posterior, the polish is, you know, the, the Z250 is fine in, in the posterior. It loses its shine uh, in the anterior uh, over probably over six months. I'm not sure why. I've got a few patients that um, are able to maintain the, the Z250 just like they just almost as well as the enamel. And I use enamel in all my well, most of my highly aesthetic cases. I want I want enamel looking uh, fillings. I use you use enamel. Are you talking about uh, Buddy Moppert's uh, Cosmodent in Chicago? Okay. Yeah, Cosmodent. Cosmodent. Yep, Cosmodent. Yeah. Yeah, uh, and that's that's it, at two feet you can't tell if if it's enamel or porcelain in my book, uh, you know, in my mind, and so it's certainly a lot cheaper to, to and, and the composites bond together really well. The Z250 and the enamel are very compatible. I've been bonding them together for 20 years now and haven't had any any big problems. So, anyway, that's that's sort of a in a nutshell. And I do most of my finishing with a 74 weight uh, foot ball shaped uh, carbide and it's got 30 flutes and when I'm done it's polished. The 30 fluted burr gives it a real nice uh, polish and you, you really don't need to touch the tooth after that. Uh, on the labial I use a 7901 for most of my finishing and uh, I use soft flex discs. I always polish wet to start and dry to finish because it, it, it seems to give it a better shine. It works quicker if it's wet. Uh, the the grid on the polishing disc, if you do it dry, doesn't tend to stick around it. I don't know. It just seems to work better if it's wet for, for, at the start. You get a polish quicker. And then when it's dry, it seems to give it a real shine. If you polish wet all the time, you won't get the shine. You just don't. Simple. It, you know, I don't know if anybody ever noticed it, but you don't. At least I. Who was that? Who was that man that just walked by with a ponytail? I didn't notice. That's my associate. I didn't see him, but anyway. Oh, that, that's a dentist? That's another dentist in the office. Did, did, did you have him walk through with the ponytail just to make me feel even more bad than <laughs> jealous? Were you, were you trying to ruin my day? He, he, he takes some extra gain to keep that hair. That's <laughs> not, his life isn't worth living, I don't think. That, anyway, no, I didn't. Okay, I want to I want to go back to a, a few points of what you're saying. Okay, you when I asked you your composite technique, the first thing you said was uh, use a rubber dam. Yeah. Would you go as far to say that if you're not using a rubber dam or you can't use a rubber dam or and 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 let's let's be frank 
Terry, I, a lot of dentistry in many, many countries, they don't have the suction, they don't have the air water syringe, you know, blah, blah. but would you say if you can't use a rubber dam that you should use amalgam? Uh, I, I wouldn't really, uh, you know, I would say you probably should consider, <clears throat> you know, getting another occupation. Rubber dam. Is just, why, why, are, why are you against them? So I, I'm sensing that you're against no, amalgam. No, I'm not against them. I loved amalgam. No, 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 no. Uh, it's not, that's not the, I'm just saying, if you don't, if you don't use rubber dam, I don't know. I just, I just don't think you can do the same quality dentistry day in and day out. You just can't do it. And I don't give a, a crap who you are. You can use an isolite or whatever. Uh, I just, it's really hard to do good dentistry without good isolation, period. There's just, do you ever use the isolite? I've never seen one. I've never seen, oh, on Dental Town and in the dental, in dental Products. I don't have one, no. Okay, well, um, let, let's go back to that. Um, it, it, um, I, I also think you said something interesting. You do two MODs an hour. Oh well. And I, I, I think, um, well, no, that you can't, that you would schedule an hour for two MODs. Probably yes. It, and and you're providing an outstanding service. I mean, some of those composites that you post on downtown, I just look at that and go, damn, is this guy an artist or a dentist? And and if you could do two of those an hour, I, I, I'm just saying something here where. Talk about low cost. Well, a lot of people can't afford crowns and gold inlays. Like, like I only have seven restorations in my mouth, and every one of them is a gold inlay only. But I'm I have money for that type of work. But but a lot of people who are doing the more expensive, uh, like say a CAD CAM, uh, might be uh, spending three hours on that. So if yeah. you look at the fee of that and divide that by three hours, is is each hour basically two MOD composites. Um, you know, it's uh, there, there's a lot of money to be made in placing yep. direct composites on people with less money. That's what I'm trying to say. You don't have to. Well, yeah, I, I agree. I, and, uh, and I always want to remind dentists there's a hell of a lot more money um, in McDonald's than there is in Ruth's Chris Steakhouse. But, but, for sure. But I want, but I want to go back to uh, – I am sensing some vibes about amalgam, and you seem to be hesitant. No, 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 no. I, I loved amalgam. I just don't use it. Why did you quit? Because you can't bond the stuff for, for shit. It doesn't bond. It, uh, my composites reinforce the tooth. Now, a lot of people poo-hoo that, but uh, it, the reality is that I get I don't get the same amount of fractures and cost fractures and stuff that you tend to see with amalgam. When people come here – Okay, so what year did you get out of dental school? Seventy-six. And you said you did um, amalgam till 84? Seven, yeah, 84. And I, I loved it. I carved nice marginal ridges and polished it, and, and it was it – was, so, you, so you did amalgam for eight years, and then uh, 84 to 2015, um, how many years is that? Uh, um, 30. <laughs> 30 years. So in the eight years of placing amalgams, you feel that you, through your own eyes and your own patient population, eight years of amalgams – that the following eight to ten years, you saw more failures with that than the preceding first eight years of doing composites from like say eighty four to ninety two. Yeah, and uh, 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 I, I, let me just qualify that a little bit. When I first started doing composite, uh, composites, probably in eighty three, eighty four, I did it for probably a year, and then I went back to a course again, and they said, you know, they whoever gave that course was wasn't quite as keen as the previous instructor and stuff, and and they said, you, know, you should look at these long and hard. And at the time, I was using helium motor. That's my first composite, which is a microfill, uh, which wears well. It, it, helium motor is a really nice material. And I've got, I still have a helium motor restorations running around. And so I looked at them really hard for the next six months, because I and I did a few amalgams. And I, I kept seeing them, and I said, shit, these things aren't wearing. They're looking good. What am I going back to amalgam for? Amalgam, if it bonded. I would use it, but the bond strength is like 10% of the acid etching values you get. The bond strength on amalgam to enamel is, is, is basically zilch. Uh, you know, they, they claim you can bond it, but the bond strength in comparison to a bonding to enamel is about 10% of the same, you know. So it's, I just, you know, anyway. And nobody wants mercury in their mouths. I mean, we all know, you and I, you and I know that if you went to the FDA today with this new wonderful tooth material had a mercury in it, they'd laugh you out of the building. You wouldn't even get a chance to present your evidence. You know, I mean, I'm not, I don't replace every amalgam I see. I had a guy near yesterday who wanted these amalgams out. I said, you got a couple of, I'm willing to do a couple by cuspids that are showing some wear. The rest of them are fine. I said, they, they probably will go to your graves. They were actually very nice amalgams in these molars. 
but he had a couple of ratty ones in the front. And I said, I no problem to change those. But I don't change all the amalgams, and, uh, you know, uh, I've got amalgams in my mouth. Now, what city do you live on? Is it in the coast? On the, are you on the coast? No, we're on, on the St. John River. It's Perth Andover. Perth Andover. It's a hyphenated word, two words. Is that a fishing village? Uh, it used to be. Good salmon fishing here until they built the dams on the St. John River. and then the, it's a, We're at a farming area, potato farming and lumber. We, we live in the woods, basically, the forest. A lot of, uh, a lot of lumber companies here, Irvings and Frasier. And a lot of lot of farmers here, a lot of you know McCain's McCain's Foods is the big employer here. They're they're 25 miles above us and 25 miles below us. I have I have, I have mixed feelings about dams because yesterday the uh, United States uh, came out with a report that said the average dam in America was 52 years old, and I thought, well, that's good. I'm 52 years old, and then they <laughs> said that is so damn old they're all falling apart, and and like twin that, I'm like, wait a minute, that. 50 it's not old, so those damn dams. So I want to go back to um, <clears throat> when you said some people keep them more polished, and you use renamel on the interiors. And I, I have to admit, I, I have very different standards in my office uh, for women interior. I, actually, women, I just high, very high aesthetic needs. Um, uh, someone comes in looking like, like me, we just uh, we either just take them to the vet and put them down. Or use some algum or gold, but do you think the toothpaste they're using? I mean, you know, remember Bob Ibsen, the founder of Dentad, who then went on to create Rembrandt. He had that um, Rembrandt toothpaste. Do you think that girls that are coming in with lustrous looking composites, three, four, five years later, kind of out of the norm? Do you think they're that's associated with these high high polishing toothpaste like Rembrandt? What what it is 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 the micro hybrid. Is not a, it doesn't usually loses its class like the microhub is uh, uh, what was the one there the uh, I used to use it because I got in a bit of an argument one time with Ross Nash at a course in Bermuda and and I said this stuff it was a microhybrid uh, oh Kerr makes it what's the name of it it's still in use today it's still a they've got a nap Z two Z two fifty or no that's that's made by the three M Kerr makes the uh, uh, Herculite 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 okay. yeah Herculite and uh, anyway, I said, I, it won't stay polished. And he, he said, oh, yeah, you just got to polish it right. And I said, well, whatever. But I've never found – it's a microhybrid, right, that classification. And that's what Z250 is and Z100 is as well. And they're, they're, they're microhybrids, and, and uh, uh, they just don't tend to keep their high polish after six months. But the guy – there's the, actually, there's two gentlemen that, that have managed – I veneered their teeth and bought, basically they built their did a rehab on them, and both of them keep that damn stuff just as shiny as almost like it almost looks like a microfilm. And I've asked them, and I I'm not sure why, but they don't seem to know either. So. And I I also want to say when when you say you're you still use an all bond uh, which uh, Bisco that's Bisco, uh, which was um right Bisco yeah Beyond Saw, uh, and he's now he's got what three kids and a cousin running that in uh in uh outside of Chicago. Uh, what what generation was that? Was that third generation? That's, That's fourth, fourth. That's fourth generation, fourth. and I. And what are we on now? What generation are we on now? Seventh, eighth, ninth. Yeah, eight. and 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 also I have to agree with you. I mean, the first composite I ever used was helium molar, and that was in nine. And I graduated dental school in eighty seven, so the first time I ever used it was probably like eighty five, eighty six. And I still love it the most. And don't you think that some of these old and tried and true Ivaclair's helium molar or a fourth generation Bisco A and B. Um, do you, don't you think a lot of these new generations are almost uh, came out of the marketing department and 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 it seems like it seems like a lot of dentists just the only resourcefulness they have is how to drive up overhead. It's like you know if they ever get any idea, it's how to raise their overhead. They they never can keep it simple, stupid. Use the old stuff that's been around for ten, twenty, thirty years. And I know they're looking at us too and thinking, yeah, those guys are old coggers and they should have their licensed or retired and uh, we probably look like a tyrannosaurus rex interviewing a stegosaurus rex but uh but but the bottom line is it, it's the low you said it first you, it, it's the lowest cost stuff it's the it's the new stuff is bloody expensive and could be bleeding edge and and, and some of the stuff i don't understand is like okay you have to mix a and b so like well we got it we got to get rid of that i mean really really you can't mix a and b really Really, you'll, you'll you'll try something bleeding edge for twice the money because you can't mix a drop of A and B. I mean, what at what point do you just throw in the towel? I don't know how some of these guys get their dental degrees if they can't mix A and B together and, and dab it on a tooth for a few seconds, for 30 seconds. 
is Jeff Brusham. I've heard him a couple of times, and he's excellent on bonding, dent bonding. And Out of San Francisco. His, yeah, yeah. And his his comparison is is with with hair conditioners. You know, you get shampoo, you shampoo your hair, and then you put the conditioner on. He said, well, you can buy these shampoo hair conditioners, but nobody likes them because they don't work as well. And it's the same with these single bond systems. The the, the bond strengths just aren't there. And and you know, you got to they're I'm always suspect when I see these results in the in the different magazines because, you know, the, the, the you 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 don't see too many comparisons. I mean, Kanker rails about this with his materials. He's got good materials, and you don't see too many comparisons right across the board where they start with the four. Fourth generation, use two or three of those. Fifth generation, six, and do do the same test. Do the shear strength test and all. All you do is you, you read in the, the the publicity in dental products. Uh, 3M needs a new. You know they got to keep their dental industry going, so they make a new product. 3M does make good products. Most of them do, but they're they're selling these new single bond systems, and they're convincing you it's cheaper or easier or some damn thing. It certainly isn't cheaper, but you know I, I, if they don't don't work as well as the old stuff why would you change i've been burned i've been in this dental business too long and i bought i got drawer fulls of stuff in there i give away because i it was the latest and greatest i'm getting better at it but is the latest and greatest isn't always the best simple as that well first first in the interview you have a, a handsome dentist with a ponytail walk by and then you follow that up with an example of a shampoo and hair conditioner so you're just uh you're just really trying to throw me under a bus this morning are you terry and uh, so basically, I want I want to go to a, a um, another question about the. Uh, <laughs> I want I want to go to um, another question. Well, first of all, that old stuff you have in your uh, room, I'm telling you, um, the classified ads on Dental Town. A lot of people don't realize uh, those are all free, and I can give you the names of 50 dental assistants where the dentist said, "You go sell all that old crap, all those every toy junk thing." I've ever bought and I'll split the money with you and there's dental assistants who made five ten grand in a week uh, got rid of some of these big 50,000 liters and the only thing I will throw uh, mix it fourth generation under a bus is, is uh, I don't know if it's me or the assistant but uh, you know they say one drop of A and one drop of B well how come when the A bottles empty the B bottles still half full I never I never quite I never quite figured that out maybe that's why they're trying to go to one step um, but uh, so are you um, are you have you tried Kanka stuff? Do you, do you use any of that? Are you friends with John Kanka in Middlebury, Connecticut? I know, I know John fairly well from years ago because I was the uh, CE chair of the Atlantic AGD, and he did probably five courses for us way back in the 80s and 90s. And, and I used to see him in Bermuda with Ron Jordan and Peter Jordan's crew, their clinical research and stuff. So I, I, uh, I like John. John's a straight Shooter and he's got some good materials. I haven't used them because they basically shouldn't cop out, but it's they're hard to not available in, in my part of the world. I think you have to order them. I'm not sure where you order them actually in Canada. I, I, I don't know. You don't see them advertised. Actually, I did see something from a company called Sure Dental here just a week ago, and it had a picture of John in it. But, but his his material is good stuff. He, he, John knows his business. He does. I went to uh, I went to expand Dental Town Magazine to Canada uh, for uh, those viewers around the world. Uh, Canada demographically is another California. California is 10% of the United States. Uh, the United States is 330 million. California is basically 33 million, same as Canada. They have the same number of dentists, the same size economy. Uh, the only No, 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 no. California's economy is way bigger than Canada's economy. It is. It is, it is yeah, bigger? Yeah. Oh, hell yes. Cal okay. Cal California is, you know, you know California, the land of fruits and nuts, basically. <laughs> um, yeah. <laughs> that was what Raymond, Raymond Bird a lot. He told me, told me that a long time ago. Yeah, Raymond. A that's a, that's a blast from the past. Raymond Bertolotti. I saw him on Dental Town posting the other night. Uh, I love that guy, and his uh, wife Mary is adorable. Um, but um, so what? Um, what other low hang, um pins? Is anybody still using pins? Do you do you see that in 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 Canada? Do you what? Do you think there's any need? I mean, some of these composite cases you're doing are mon are, are big cases. I mean, um, what, tell us your thoughts on pins. No pins, no pins. You don't need pins with composite. I mean, that's, I don't know where I was taught that, but it's, that's been something that's been sort of known for 20 plus years, I think. I had a patient in the other day and he had a, a, an upper six molar with three big pins in it. And I just shuddered and the guy had it done last summer. 
and uh, you know, I, I don't know why you'd put a pin in a, you know, under a composite. There really is not much retentive value there. Okay, and then um, I, I agree with that. Um, but um, what about liners and bases? I mean, that that seems to be. Um, it seems like there's a lot of differing opinions on that. What What are your views on liners and bases? I don't use them. Uh, basically, Kanka said 25 years ago. Well, if you got a hybrid layer, you plug the dental tubules, uh, case over. You, you know, you, there's no advantage to putting, you know, if you've got a bleeding pulp, there's, you know, I will pulp cap a tooth. I use Theracal for a, a small pulp cap, but... Uh, Theracal? Ther what? Theracal is the new stuff from, uh, I don't know, who is Theracal? Who makes, is that, is that Ultradent or is that Bisco? Is that a calcium hydroxide? Uh, no, it's, it's, it's... it's it's not calcium hydroxide. No, it's not calcium hydroxide. I think it's lithium. Oh, I don't know what the hell it is. I, I better not say it. I don't, I, anyway, Theracal, it's, a, it's in average. They advertise the hell out of it now. Just Google it. It's, yeah, well, it's it's a good, you know, if you're going to use a, a pulp cacking thing. But why do you bother? Uh, that's my question. If you've got a hybrid layer, if you've, if you've primed your dentin properly, it's sealed. Uh, just put your red resin on and put your composite in and save yourself all those steps of it's just another way to do the fillings quicker if you want to save time don't use pins don't use any any liners or bases they're not necessary I've been doing I don't have a lot of uh, abscesses after under these big composites I mean you've seen a lot of them there's not much tooth structure left and they go on they chug along they're they're primed uh, you know the I just don't see the sense of it and and uh, um, talk more about um bulk fill versus increments what your, your thoughts on that well most of the teeth I feel a regular routine say MOD would probably take me four to five six increments maximum uh, as I understand it the, uh, the bulk fills are not very good on you can't use them on the occlusal surface because they're too soft if I'm not mistaken and everybody's going to have to put a layer of, over the occlusal well that's you're into two steps uh, it doesn't take me that long. I have a, a curing light, a, a ultradent curing light. It works really well. I do a 10 second cure usually. Uh, and and is that, okay, ultradent, that's Dan Fisher yep, in South Jordan, Utah. Um, yep. Is that an LED light? Yeah, it's a good light. It's got three lights. There's three bulbs in it. And so you get each of your wavelengths. And I, I, I cru I, I cure my resin 20, 10 seconds, and I cure the increments 10 seconds, and I do the the, ginger, the, the mesial wall. I do that in one piece. I wedge uh, wedge it, and I do, do the distal wall. If it's a really deep filling, I don't wedge it. I put the two two millimeters along the gingival margin, and then then and harden that. Then I wedge that because if you put your I'm using plastic uh, uh, matrices, and if you wedge them really hard, you they'll deform then de into the bus so I that's what you don't want to have happen and so I usually will fill them out the the, the matrices run to the gingiva they held and held against the uh, the gingival wall by the rubber dam and just the friction the damn things will, and I use a matrix band a lot of the Tolfemeyer to hold them but I just put two millimeters incisally and harden that then I wedge them and then I get a good contact so you know that's and what's the name what's the name of that alternate light uh, it's a uh, Oh, jeez. Uh, uh, does it have a knife? Does it have a knife? Oh yeah, oh, yeah. On it or? A, it's a big. Uh, it's just a big ad in the in the. I, okay, so I want I want to back you up a little bit. What you said was very very profound. Um, that it's counterintuitive. You think the harder you place that wedge in there, the more you're going to separate the teeth and you're going to get a tighter contact. But you're saying what happens is you deform the plastic and now you're you're defeating the purpose of the wedge. Um, look, look, Let's talk about context because a lot of dentists tell me that the reason they prefer making indirects whether and taking an, uh, an impression in either central lab or an optical impression to the lab or uh, or, may, or using CAD CAM, CIRAC, or uh, Plan Mecca just bought E4D is, is the contact. Um, you you just said you're just using a regular old Tolfemeyer, um, which was which came out of the amalgam era. Um, have you have you tried any of these other matrices like you know you here Garrison and all these other ones to uh, triodent uh, talk talk about talk about contacts how do you how do you get a contact and what how specifically do you get a contact and how, how do you do that well there's several ways I've got some very small uh, thin bands that I got from clinical research and they're uh, they're very very 
or I don't know what, one or two thousandths of an inch, whatever it is. They're, they're really tiny. But I use mostly uh, Premier uh, Premier Dental's uh, contoured matrix bands. The blue, they're blue colored now. And uh, like I said, if if I I wedge them just like you would a regular uh, metal matrix band, or if 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 I feel that the gingival box is deep, I will add two millimeters roughly and put that, cure that, and then I put my wedge against that, and that way I don't deform the band into the box. And you know, you can we, we wedged amalgam for years, mind you, and and uh, it, you know you got good contact. Actually, a lot of times your contacts are too damn good. You know, they they were too tight. I mean, I I don't know how many times over the last you know 30, 30 years I've uh, I've taken metal matrix finishing strips uh, the brassler ones and gone between amalgams to relieve the contact pressure because I you couldn't hardly floss for them and I've done that numerous times and I do that a lot today even with composite because a lot of times the damn contacts are tight and especially if some of the composite ones are sharp they'll tear your floss even though they're not they're not a you know bad contact they're just tight and uh, the occlusal sometimes when people do them they don't they don't open it, an embrasure there on the occlusal surface. And one way I do that is at a 7901. I'll drag it across back and forth at a 40, 45 degree angle, uh, lay it right down in the contact, and just drag it back and forth and open up the contact, not the contact, open up the embrasure on the occlusal sort of thing, so you can get so you can get the floss started, so it's not two sharp angles, you know, on the occlusal. That that it's, flossing uh, must be a Canadian issue because Americans don't floss. So uh, you know, you'll, you'll never have a, you'll never have an American come in and say afraid the floss. They're usually uh yeah I get my teeth flossed twice a year and you do it both times. Um, so that's interesting what you said. So you're you're filling the gingival floor before you place the matrix. I mean before you place the uh, the the wedge. That, that's a that's a profound idea. That that that's a heck of a pearl. I bet a lot of dentists out there are scratching their head thinking that is a hell of an idea. i mean, I well what. what? What you can do if you're nervous about getting an overhang, and I do it sometimes, but a lot of times I can see in there with my magnification and my headlight. I mean, that's that's the other great thing besides rubber dams. The, those three things are, if I didn't have the rubber dam and the headlight and the magnification, I'd probably quit dentistry. It's just, it's that it's that important. And if you ever use it after a year, I, you'll never give up any of those three things if you use them regularly. Oh, you know? I'll tell you what, I am. Um... I bought myself a backup because I one day went in there and my uh, I I something had happened and the lens had fogged, and I I said I, I'm not doing dentistry. And they go, Oh come on, you can do it without them. I'm like, No, I once once you use that. So so be specific. Um, there's what what brand of um of uh, magnification are you using? What I'm using designs designs for vision. Designs for vision, and um, that's um and what magnification. That's two and a half. I tried the three and a half, and I found that I couldn't find my hands, and I only gave it a, a half a day trial, and and I just said, uh, I see well enough. I mean, and I listen to these, these guys talk about scopes and stuff. They got five and ten times magnification, and you sort of they try to make you feel inadequate, and they probably do, but I think I think two and a half is the minimum. But uh, you know, I just found the three and a half was, I don't know, I couldn't, you know, it's a learning curve with it, and I just. Didn't, didn't bother to. And I noticed your uh, associate walking by at the ponytail. He he was had magnification too. Oh yeah, yeah. Well, it, it, now uh, nowadays the last three, four, five years, it's uh, two and a half is compulsory at a dental school. It's, it's 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 required. And and I want to say something that you know every time I hear a dentist complain like you know what do you do when your hygienist been with you for like eight years and you go in there and you do a hygiene exam and you know they left a big old chunk of tartar on there and I'm like ah uh, well you're wearing loops how come your hygienist isn't so i i buy them for um all my hygienists all my assistants um but you're right everybody stays at two and a half but me i am um, i did the um uh, 3.8 or is it 3.5 or 3.8 uh next up from, from designs well designs is 3.5 i i had some so yeah that that's what i i went up to that i i mean i'm in love with that um uh, but but yeah <laughs> magnification you, you can't expect your dental assistant and your hygienist to be in the same league as you, if you can well, see. I, I I have two hygienists, and I the younger one took to the took the magnification like a duck to water, and she loves it. And 
her work is better now, for sure. I mean, because she sees everything. She sees so much better. And the other girl's older, and she doesn't want to do it. But I, I wish she would, because if you do, if you use it for a month, you'll, you won't, you'll never go back. Mm -hmm. You know, you'll never go back. Yeah. And and and, and I told her I'd, I'd pay half of it. But I, actually, after six months. I said, you're good. I said, as long as you stay here for at least a year, I'll, you know, I'll, you're, and after a year, I paid, I, I had paid the whole thing, and I told her if she stayed less than a year, I'd, she'd have to pay half of it, but she's been here five, six years now, so, or since. So, um, so I noticed that you're a hockey fan, and hockey does not promote oral health. They all, all hockey does is knock, is knock teeth out, so, uh, hey. <laughs> and and, I, and I'm, I'm evidence of that. I got three front teeth rattled when I was a kid. Or when I was 20, hockey stick in the mouth and three crowns, three posts and cores and stuff. Yeah. Long time ago. Uh, it's it's good for, for business. But yeah, actually, we don't see hardly any hockey injuries anymore. Uh, my wife did smuck my son in the mouth playing hockey in the basement, playing street hockey in the basement. And I had to do a root canal on his front tooth and he was nine years old. So, But you don't, we don't see hardly any hockey injuries in the dental office now. But I you know. notice I, I I have heard that in Canada, um, everything beneath the pros, it's a face mask is mandatory. Oh, oh yeah, they're not they're shields, they're face shields. Yeah, they're, but they're, but the pros the, the whole still thing. use them. No, well the pros are you know they, it's an image thing, but most of them do wear the uh, shields now for their eyes. That's the only reason I'd wear a shield is for your eyes. To hell with your teeth. I mean you can get your teeth fixed, but your eyes you can't. But you the know. pro but but I I don't ever see hardly pro hockey players oh. wearing shields. Oh, uh, they wear eye shields. A lot of them do. Yeah, you just eye eye shields. Yep. You see the helmet, and you don't probably see the shield because it only comes down to their nose. But it, it, you, a lot of them wear them. A lot of them do. Huh. And your uh, your greatest citizen uh, left uh, now lives up the street from me, the Wayne Gretzky, right? <laughs> well, he was at one time, probably yeah. for sure. Uh, Did you do his teeth? No, I didn't do his teeth, but uh, that somebody, somebody yeah, did. Yeah, he's. Uh, <laughs> He didn't have that teeth. Those teeth when he left Canada. I know that. <laughs> oh, that's uh, that's so funny when they built that uh, team down here, the Phoenix Coyotes. And, uh, man, during a game, they will pan to the bench. And everybody, I guess, takes their, their partial out for the game because uh, they'll pan that whole bench. And I think I think all the players combined only have 30, 40 teeth. They're all missing uh, uh, front teeth in large numbers. So uh, so I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take a uh, – I'm forty minutes. I'm two thirds down, and forty minutes down. I only got twenty minutes less. I want to switch gears. I, I don't want to frame you as someone who just does composites. Um, I'm. You, you've been doing dentistry for three decades. Um, you know, almost, every, almost four. <laughs> almost four decades. So, so I, I want to ask you a couple of questions. Uh, you got five thousand American children coming out of dental schools each year. Uh, they're, they're carrying on average uh, two hundred fifty to three hundred thousand dollars in student loans. Um, if if your own child that your wife was uh, uh, abusing in the basement with a hockey stick, knocking his front teeth out, where you uh, um, if, if your own child was walking out of dental school right now in the United States or Canada and was packing two hundred fifty to three hundred thousand dollars of debt, uh, what fatherly advice would you give that that young child? Uh, well, I'd go to a get the hell out of the, the cities. I know that. I know. Parts of northern Maine are underserviced. Uh, you know, I'm not sure how much money you'll make, but you, you, you'd at least make a make a pretty good living. And uh, I, I, that's a tough question, really. We have the same thing in Canada. I mean, they're not probably coming up with three hundred thousand, but two hundred thousand. I know my associate here. When he graduated, he was two hundred thousand dollars in the hole, and he is associating in Canada. Most the when they associate, most of the people uh, the. the deal Deal is you get 40% of what you gross. That's a pretty standard thing. And uh, most guys will practice, they'll associate two or three years and they'll buy in or whatever, and uh, or else they'll take off on their own. But it's harder and harder to do that. Although you, the, in the States, I think you got a lot more dentists per capita than we do. Uh, we, we, I'm not sure how many we're graduating a year in Canada, but it's I don't think it's anywhere near the, the number you guys are graduating. It's, uh, it's a, I don't know, it's, it's a, it's a tough question. Well you, well, you are saying something profound, and that is in America, two thirds of the graduates go to uh, where half the people live in the 117 largest towns, yeah. and then one third go to where they're needed. I mean, we we uh, see this Canada. I mean, Canada. What what is Canada like? Twice the size of the United States in uh, square kilometers. And yeah, it it could be. I it could be. 
it's it's pretty huge. Yeah, and and uh, we, we see that over and over in America where the, those kids who go to those small towns where they're needed. I mean, supply and demand. You should go where you're wanted, and they always want to go where nobody wants them. I want to ask you another question. These dentists coming out of school, a lot of them are um, complaining about uh, $250,000 or, or student loans, but then they walk out of school and they'll buy a $150,000 CAD cam and a $150,000 CBCT 3D x-ray machine and a $50,000 laser it's like man you just doubled your dental school debt with three purchases so if you were if it was your daughter that just walked out of dental school and she said dad i'm already 250 into this i'm gonna go i'm gonna go in all the way i'm gonna do another 250 and get a, a CIRAC and a cbct and a laser what would you tell her about that because she's if she's thinking i need to do that to be a good quality dentist like my dad what would you tell well, her well, actually, I'm encouraging my daughter to. She's finishing her master's in kinesiology right now, and I've been encouraging her to go into dentistry. And she's uh, she's thinking. I think she's going to take a couple courses next year and, and try to get in. Uh, but I certainly I know there's a young fellow five miles away, six miles away, and he he bought a practice. And man, they they laid some money into that thing, and they renovated six operatories and uh, all new equipment and a CAD cam and and. and X-ray and you know I, I don't know he must have spent three hundred four hundred thousand and I know he's not as busy as he'd like. I just I don't know. It's, I think it when you get that far in debt, your your judgment's got to you got to be careful because you see those you know those fillings and you know they're not that bad because I I see a lot of stuff and I it's getting worn and chipped. I said well we'll catch that next time we'll keep an eye on it and uh, you know check it in seven months nine months a year. I don't jump all over it. Uh, my my associate on the other hand he he. He he'll see patients of mine when I'm not here, and I get back, and there's guys coming in for three fillings, and I said, well, look, we've been watching those fillings for several years. I don't sort of need the money, I guess, and I don't need the business, so I don't, you know, I'm in a good position. But if I was hungry and had two hundred, three hundred, four hundred thousand dollars in debt, I might be inclined to do those fillings, and uh, you know, it's is it a bad decision? They're they're probably going to have a better filling. Uh, you know what? Where is the point where you decide to let it go for another year, or do you jump on it and do it? I, you know, that's a judgment call, and that's a hard, uh, you know, it's a hard thing to. It's a hard. Well, call. like how they say, the easiest dollar earned is a dollar in taxes delayed. The second easiest dollar earned is a dollar in expenses saved, and the hardest dollar you'll ever earn is doing another dollar of sales and paying your overhead and trying to take home a dollar. And uh, it, it's amazing how um, some. Some dentists just um, they just have no problem with uh, forty to forty five percent overhead, and other dentists, I mean, it's like when they hit seventy five percent overhead, the only thing they'll do in the next five years is figure out how to get it to eighty. I mean, like I say, their only resourcefulness is spending money and driving up their overhead. And uh, and we were talking about how uh, you know if if you don't have the money, you don't have the money. So there's no um, spending it now on your on your associates is are, are they an employee associate or are you going to partner with them uh well that's a that's a good a good question uh <clears throat> where the office building i have is is in a it's in a flood zone now the river flooded here a few years ago and uh if you were to wanted to buy this building you can't get a mortgage from the banks because it's part of the flood zone and the banks won't touch anything in a flood zone so he's not keen on buying the building uh, so it's sort of up in the air. We're trying to, we're trying to, I'm not sure what we're going to do. So, so how, can I ask how old you are, Doc? How old are you? Uh, 60, it'll be 68 in three weeks. Okay. Um, do you remember when we were little, they were saying the planet was cooling? Yeah. And now, <laughs> and now they're all saying it's warming. Um, do you think it turned into a flood zone because in your lifetime, do you think it's global warming that's causing the oceans to rise? Uh, Oh, well, what that's part of it. It's definitely the climate because we get a lot more swings. Uh, part of the problem here in New Brunswick, uh, about uh, about two thirds, about let me see, what's the figure? Uh, approximately ten thousand square miles in northern Maine all drains into this river that goes the, the the river. A lot of the rivers in northern Maine they drain north and then they drain east into Canada into New Brunswick. So we got a lot of water coming at us and Maine gets a lot of a lot of uh, snow. Uh, and they've been cutting the forest to Beat Hill. It used to be your forests for trees that rained, the, tr the, the snow would lay under the trees and the, the sun didn't hit it till May or June. Now it's just bare. There's not a lot of trees or, or they're very small. So it melts a lot quicker. The runoff is faster. It's just 
it just it just bang and within a week or two everything melts and it's it's running by us and that's a big part of it so that's not really global warming it's global warming caused by man cutting all the damn trees down so there's a lot of combinations a lot of things but you know global warming definitely is part of it because it's i mean the north of canada the eskimos the ice is melting the polar bears don't have any ice flows anymore because the damned ice is melting so it's, it's definitely and I, and I want to say one thing to the viewers though <clears throat> a lot a lot of these kids will go out and they'll get a job and they'll get paid uh you know in the big cities like in phoenix i, I pay my associates 25 percent because God, there's two dental schools, a thousand gazillion dentists. But I know to get a dentist to go in some of these very small towns, uh, they'll pay him 40%, sometimes 50% because that's supply and demand. You might be the only guy who will live in a town of 5,000. Uh, but um, what I what I want to um, what I want to cost these young kids and is then they they're um, um, they're humans are control freaks. They're territorial. They they want to buy into a piece of rock. And I always remind them that uh, you know marriage. You find someone you want to have sex with and get naked with and have children, and that fails half the time. And now you're going to marry an old dentist who you don't get naked with, have sex with, you don't have children, you don't celebrate holidays, and it's just, gosh, it's almost usually a really bad idea. And I, I would I would tell a young kid, if, if you're working in an office and you're getting 40%, that, that, mean, that means that, I mean, half the dentist, the average overhead in America is 65%. So if you locked in at 40%, you already have 5% less overhead than the average dentist in America. And you, and, and you don't have any of the stress of ownership. You're not carrying debt. You're not paying interest on money. My God, why? I, and I still, how many marriages do you know where they dated for five years and it was just like beautiful? And then they get married, and the whole thing goes to crap. And two years later, they're divorced. And uh, I, I, I don't know. Uh, I think that uh, happened. I, I think that happened to me. <laughs> well, well, what part of that story? Well, I guess it was ten years. <laughs> no, I was divorced. Oh, okay. And okay. Um, yeah, so uh, that's uh, true. When uh, um, the only women who uh, want my autograph, they want it on an alimony check. And uh, but uh, so so then also your. Um, a member of the Academy of General Dentistry. Would, if a young kid came up to you and said, "Hey, boss, uh, you know, dues, AGD, is that a good thing? Do you recommend that? Did, how did that affect your career?" Yeah. Well, in my case, I, uh, the courses I was going to when I first heard Ron Jordan and John Kanka were put on by AGD, and uh, and probably ten years after those courses, uh, one of the guys involved in the AGD pestered me a little bit, and I joined it probably fifteen or twenty. Close to 20 years ago now, and so I'm part of the uh, of the uh, of the academy, and we provide uh, three courses a year, three one-day courses a year, yeah, usually in Moncton, New Brunswick, and uh, we get anywhere from probably oh from 50 to 150 people at our courses, and uh, we get to, the vicing is being part of the the executive. We get to pick the the guys that come to talk, the speakers, the CE speakers. So, you know, if there's somebody I want to here or see we we try to you know we try to get them so I, that's in, you know good for me uh, and I also go to a fair bit of CE I enjoy CE I enjoy I enjoy learning it's nice to keep ahead of the curve a little bit or, or try to. I want to I want to say the young viewers what the AGD did for me and that is uh, <clears throat> I think when young kids come out of school and they take uh, their own courses um, they, they just take a few little areas because that's where you're interested and I remember when I signed up for the AGD um, you know, I, I wanted to get my FAGD, and then I saw that I had to take, I was like 16 classes in like 16, eight different areas or whatever. It was 500 hours over five years, take a test, but they, they spread out, and I got so mad because I, I called the guy that talked me into joining, and I said, uh, I don't want to take classes in these subjects, and he just said, Howard, he goes, you know, you, you need to cross train, and, and, and the greatest um, implantologist, Carl Misch, was because he was a removable prosthetics guy first, and he'd see these people putting dentures on uh, four implants in a hater bar and then be complaining that the implant was weak and snapped. And Carl said, well, hell, your bite was off so bad. That was the worst denture I'd ever seen. And, and Carl was always saying to learn how to do fixed removable, you need to learn removable first. I look at the, the TMJ people. I mean, they say things that if you just did one single orthodontic case, in your entire lifetime, you would know is crazy. And uh, and they, they've never done an ortho case. So, I mean, you have to 
to learn ortho to understand occlusion. I mean, everything's cross training. And what I liked about it, so I'll just succinctly say, um, how many times would you walk into a convention and take a uh, dental pharmaceutical course on uh, different antibiotics when you could have a super sexy implant course or bone grafting? But you're like, oh, I got to go take this this pharmacy course because I'm trying to get my FAGD and then later my MAGD. And then when you'd get done with that course, you're like, God dang, I'm glad I took that course. And so I, I never would have taken half the courses. Um, in, in, in fact, the funniest thing was to do the implants. I literally was yelling at the guys saying, I'm not ever going to place implants. Uh, why can't I take them and something else? He goes, Howard, just take the implants. Course. So I so to knock out my whole deal, I signed up for Carl Misch's seven three day weekends so I could just knock out that requirement. And little did I know, by the end of the first day, I was in love with Carl Misch. I was in love with implants, and it was all brought to me by the AGD forcing me into this curriculum. So uh, uh, and and then the second thing, and then the second thing I would say about the AGD is that when you join and go to those meetings, it's the friends you make because you're sitting. At, I mean, how many friends have you made in the AGD? that have, yeah, and, and they have similar interests like you. I mean, some dentists, some dentists are, aren't into CE and others are, and to have, to walk into meetings and have all these CE junkie friends, then they turn into your bike riding friends and jogging friends and, uh, in my case, uh, drinking buddy friends. Uh, but, um, so, so I'm, I'm down to uh, uh, just three and a half more minutes. Give your daughter that just walked out of dental school any more fatherly advice for from a man who's coming up on uh, four decades of doing dentistry and they're just coming out of dental school. What other low-hanging fruit well, advice would well, you give her? As I sent a little <clears throat> blurb I sent to Rebecca there, but uh, I enjoy my work. I, I think dentistry is the greatest job in the world. Uh, you get to change people's smiles or improve their smiles. Uh, they come into you in pain and they walk out very thankful and they pay me money to do this which is I find very amazing and uh, they pay us good money and uh, I just I just think I'm very fortunate to be where I am in this point and retirement a lot of people you know they're at me but when I'm going to retire and I'm probably going to work for a few more years and uh, I might work for longer I don't know I'm not, as long as I'm healthy and I'm relatively healthy uh, uh, I just you know retirement is scares the hell out of me and a lot of people today you'll see a lot of people over the age of 65 continuing to work and some of them into their 70s and uh, you know I can't imagine that you'll retire when you're 65 you know well I was gonna ask I was gonna tell you that um I, I, I think retirement's crazy I mean I know so many deaths uh, if for you know basically the the only safe investment you would have would be a government bond which pays five percent and you would need a million dollars for every $50,000 a year you're gonna make. And I know, I was talking to a good friend of mine uh, last night, uh, Kenny Anderson. Uh, uh, he just celebrated his, his dental office 50 years. And, and we were sitting here and he's like, he still does Tuesdays and Thursdays from six to noon and still makes more money than you and I, you know I mean? Just still just crushing it. And it's like, he still loves it. He gets out of the house. I, I think, I think of, what a deal about the retirement is, you know, they, they work crazy hours to the end, then they just cut it off and sell the practice. Well, then the government's going to take half your money. And why don't you just kind of slow down, enjoy life. If you, you know, quit working Fridays. Uh, if you, if you hate staying late, quit do, just, I think the goal should be every year you work one hour less and make $1 more. Um, and like what Dennis, uh, one of my friends always says that he'd rather be uh, beaten with a belt than do a root canal. Well, then that's what endodontists are for. Just do what you like, gradually slow down and play because when you don't retire, uh, you're going to make so much money um, by staying in the game and it, it's um, much more healthier and it's a better lifestyle. And uh, yep. well, I'm, well I've, I've, I've worked 32 hours a week, four days a week for the last 30 years. So, uh, you know, I'm done between fr Thursday night at five o'clock and Monday morning at five five o'clock Monday morning, that's half of a week. So I work basically my four days in half of a week, and I have a half a week off. And that that's good on your head, real good. Yeah, absolutely. Um, well, hey Terry, I just want to um, I want to thank you for your twelve hundred posts on Dental Town. Uh, you're, you're a meat and potatoes guy. You're you're always showing great 
dentistry. Uh, so many people have, uh, you know, I'll, I'll say, uh, why do you like Dentaltown? And they're always name dropping, you, you know, watching your techniques. And, and, and again, um, you know, everybody wants to talk about these sexy Star Wars CBCT and lasers and all that stuff. And, and man, you're just keeping it real on daily family dentistry, direct composites, fourth generations, still in love with the old stuff. And man, I, I just wish all my viewers on, uh, on Dentaltown or iTunes or YouTube would actually uh, log on and do a search for Terry Shaw. And um, um, Terry, thank you so much for, for all that you do for dentistry and for Dentaltown. And tell your daughter that if she doesn't go to dental school, that's a hell of a lot easier to marry a dentist than to go to dental school. <laughs> all right, Terry. Thanks again for all you do, buddy. All right. Bye-bye.